Hey everybody, Aaron Bishop here with Derish Chai on behalf of the Patterns of Life Bible. Uh, this, this lesson, we're going to kind of go through, we're going to begin a series going through the early chapters of Genesis. Um, the early chapters of Genesis, we're all pretty familiar with the stories. You have the creation account in Genesis 1, then you have the, uh, the creation account again in chapter 2, uh, and then you have the creation of the woman, and then you have the, the fall of man, as it's commonly come to be called. And we're going to go through uh, the second, third, and the fourth paracopes of Genesis. We're not going to do Genesis 1 because it's such a popular one. It's so uh, There's so many other um, teachers out there that do great teachings on the parallelism, parallelism that is found in Genesis 1. We're not going to, I'm not going to bother with that uh, because it's already been done. Uh, if you really want to uh, dig into that, just search the parallelism of Genesis 1 on Google and you're going to come back with a lot of teachings on it. Then try searching the paracopes or the chiasms of Genesis 2 and see just how few responses you get on that. So that's why we're going to try and fill in these gaps that others haven't yet covered. So we're going to start with Genesis paracope 2 today. All right, Genesis Pericope 2. This is Genesis chapter 2, and it's only verses 14, 4 through 16. It's not the entire chapter. It's half of the chapter, in fact. It's the, the Garden of Eden, the creation of the Garden of Eden. And as we we'll go through it, we'll notice that it is, in fact, a creation story. Because A and B, they, they give us the clues to that right away. Because how do they match? Well, Verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. As it's describing here, there were no plants in the field. There were no herbs growing at this point, at least in the Garden of Eden area. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole aspects of, uh, of scientifically what's going on here. Um, I do highly recommend John Walton's Lost World series, uh, Lost World of Creation, excellent, excellent book that I think does a great job of nailing down the ancient Near East perspective on what's happening here and how it, it is not describing anything scientifically because ancient peoples weren't concerned with scientific method. They weren't concerned with methodology. They were concerned with function. And so when you approach the text from a point of view of function rather than methodology, you actually come up with some different answers and different ideas of what's happening in the text. It's a really fascinating read. Give it a look. So Garden of Eden begins with no plant in the garden. And then at the A prime, verse 16, what is it that we read of there? The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So it starts with no plants, no garden, nothing growing, and it ends with a garden, with trees, with plants that man can eat from freely, including two trees, one that brings life and the other that brings death if eaten up. We'll get a little more into that one in the, in the next lesson. Then uh, continuing on in verse 5, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. However, when we go to B prime in 15, the Lord God took the man and he put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to, to guard it, to work it and to guard it, are the Hebrew words there, Eved and Shemar. Um, this was the job of, of man in the garden. And so again, A was there was no garden, and then A prime, there was a garden. B, same thing. B, there was no man. B prime, now there is a man. And then in C, but there went up a mist from the earth and it watered the face of the ground. And then verse 10 through 14 describes four rivers that go out and water all of the earth. So this, they're both describing this water that is watering everything. The first one is this primordial water that comes up and waters the earth. And in the, uh, in the C prime, it's the rivers, it's four rivers that come out of the Garden of Eden that then water all of creation. Um, in the ancient Near East, this would have made the Garden of Eden a hilltop, a mountaintop, uh, because waters flow downhill. Obviously, that's ancient Near East uh, science. That's the, that's the best they had. Waters flow downhill. If four rivers come out from Eden and they're watering the entire earth, then Eden is on the mountaintop. Where is the mountaintop? 
The mountaintop is where God and man come together and meet. It's where temples will, were built. Uh, it's a lot deeper in that. The John Walton book gets really deep into that stuff. Uh, and then in D, in D prime, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And then in D prime, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant of the sight and good for food. The tree of life is also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge, good and evil. So things being brought forth out of the ground, man was brought forth out of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And trees were brought forth out of the ground that were good for food. Two, those two specific trees also being described. And then right there in the center, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. The planting of the creation of the Garden of Eden is the center of this pericope in Genesis 2. It is the central portion that is being highlighted. Now, the bits about the mountaintop temple, the waters flowing downhill, what those four rivers all represent, um, bits of geography, stuff like that, it, it's uh, got all sorts of stuff wrapped up in it. There's all sorts of ideas and symbols specifically wrapped up in this. Uh, one of the things we'll actually find is that those words that were applied to Adam, to the man in the garden, to work it and to keep it, to evet it, to, to serve in it, and to shamar it, to guard it as a as kind of a military action, we only ever find those two words used in conjunction together three times in Scripture. Once here. And both of the other times are in the book of Numbers when it's describing the duties of the Levites in regards to the tabernacle. It's actually a really cool study because the, the priesthood and the Levites that are being set up, they're almost as though they're a new Adam, they're a new man that is being set in the garden, the tabernacle, which is full of all sorts of garden imagery. It's the place where God and man meet on the mountaintop. It's the, there's so much of this Garden of Eden uh, language wrapped up in that. And to work it and to guard it, that was the job of the priests and the Levites. Think on that. When God created the tabernacle, when he brought Israel out of Egypt, what was the purpose? He was reforging the Garden of Eden. He was creating a place where man and God could dwell together. It's pretty cool, right? So think on that. Study it out. There's a ton of awesome imagery there. Also read John Walton's Lost World of Creation. Excellent book. He's got several books in that series. All of them highly recommend those books. Um, give them a look. Uh, if you've got Hoopla, once again, they're on Hoopla. At least they are for me in my library. Uh, just check it out. Get a library card, go on Hoopla and see if you can get it for free. Totally worth it, um, in my opinion. So if you want to learn more on that, dig deeper into this ancient Near East mindset and how uh, ancient peoples viewed scripture and how that can help us to inform us to view scripture, uh, I highly recommend those books. So until next time, Shalom.